Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Listen with Vobes. It's the 7th, I think, of January 2021. Uh, it is indeed, and it's nearly four o'clock. We are going to resume our Children in the, of the Archbishop story novel by Norman Collins and what a remarkably humorous at times uh, story it is. Um, we will continue that on part seven, I think we are also at. But first, let's say a few hellos to the people as, as they arrive to watch the wonderful audience that make all of this possible. Hello to the lovely Julia out there, to TurboStream, to Tall Podge Rodge, to Justine Jones, to Cooper68, to Audrey Forbes Hamilton, to Philip Hammond and Mary uh, to John F, to Steve G and Dave over yonder and many others I'm sure out there who are not contributing on the chat. Don't feel that you're being left out if you're unable to or you're watching in a mode that doesn't or you just prefer not to. You're very, very welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, to Josh Hastings who's just arrived and said good evening. It feels like evening, doesn't it? It's only four o'clock. It's still only afternoon. <laughs> but uh, we've had sun here uh, Turbo says it's uh, been sunny and frosty in the Shire, but um, it's, who is it? Justine Jones says a very foggy Somerset. It's been foggy all day, apparently. We've had sunshine and actually the lovely Julia and I, um, we met up because we're in each other's bubbles. They're the only person that I'm officially allowed to meet. Um, and we made a video. We were on the beach, uh, sitting on rocks, drinking soup and munching on not pork pies as such, but bacon and cheese, uh, what would you call pastry pies, that like pork pies, that same sort of thing. Uh, so we, and, and the sun was blasting down on us. It was, I'm not saying it's warm, <laughs> but it was warmer uh, in, the, uh, in the sun than in the shade. And as we were walking, um, the ground in every bit of shadow still had frost on it. And it was only by about half past 12 that the frost in the sun had really started to melt properly. Uh, beautiful day it's been, so stayed in and hoovered. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Well, what a lovely thing to do on a night. Go out when it's raining, why don't you? But stay in and hoover, at least you weren't hovering, um, when it's sunny. Sensible Paul. Hello to you, Sensible Paul. Uh, good afternoon. Looking forward to today's reading. It's lovely to see you here. Thank you very much. My phone is going. I suppose it's going to be chippering away. I'm actually going to put it on silent because um, it was annoying me yesterday. As you know, it was wonderful having the sun shining on her face. We did at one point, and you'll see in the video, we were surrounded by ravens from the Tower of London. Oh, no, sorry. Crows or rooks, one of the three. Anyway, we are, according to this, we're on chapter XV1. What is that? 16. With Mr. Pavarius as our starting word, which makes me smile every time. I, I'm already amused by the name Mr. Pavarius. Dear, oh dear. Sean's Garden Diary is here. I'm just going to pull my trousers a little bit. So just excuse me, doing something rather personal on the thing. Ah, just pulling them up. I've got long johns on. Ah, and do you know what they're like? They ride down, and when you bend your knee and you're sitting down, it um, pulls on your leg. The only thing about then pulling them up so that the creases don't pull is that now my ankles, or just above the ankles, are exposed. It's bloody irritating, isn't it? Can't quite get comfy. Sean says it's a yellow day. Josh says thumbs up. Yes, stick your thumbs right up. So here we go, Mr. Pavarius. Mr. Pavarius was back at Charing Cross Road again. He went there a lot nowadays, and every time he got out of Leicester Square Underground Station, it did something to him. He felt better, younger, sprightlier, springier, and above all, creative. His mind enlarged suddenly. Altogether, it was as though the air that blew up Shaftesbury Avenue was oxygen, pure 
oxygen. Everything that he saw delighted him. The bird prints and the maps of old London. The bookshop that was preoccupied with world revolution. The one almost next door that was dedicated to reconciled and a- acquiescent looking nudes. The stark simplicity of the Welsh chapel. The monographs on the ballet. And the gentlemen's outfitters, particularly the gentlemen's outfitters, fairly intoxicated now by and with the sheer exhilaration of the place, Mr. Pavarius plunged inside and bought himself a saffron necktie with magenta spots. Then, carried away by the charm of the little emporium, he purchased a pair of braces with horses' heads on them and a yellow bandana handkerchief with a design of horse shoes to go with the tie and braces. Within limits, he could afford to be self-indulgent nowadays because, compared with himself on the first timid visit that he had paid to Mr Jerome, He was now in a different class of men altogether. He was a success, a hit, a somebody. Not that all his numbers had rung bells, of course. Handbag Hanky, in particular, had failed to strike even the faintest chord in the public consciousness. It might well have... (laughs) Handbag Hanky. You can just imagine that, can't you? Handbag hanky, you got to have a bit of hanky-panky with handbag hanky. Do-do-do-do-do-do. Yeah, maybe not. Um, it might just as well never have been written. But the other little piece, Four O'Clock Doll, the title had come to him last Christmas during choir practice for the Messiah had got there all right. Only this morning he'd heard the milk boy whistling in Putney High Street. And another composition of his, in an entirely different vein this time, entitled Desolation, looked as though it was going to repeat the success of Four O'Clock Doll. No matter how much the Reverend Sidney Pavarius might be kicked around inside Archbishop Bodkin Hospital, here, in the Charing Cross Road, Mr Berkeley Cavendish was on the up and up. It was significant that Mr Spike Jerome, his publisher, no longer kept him waiting when he called. And on the whole, Mr Pavarius rather regretted it, because he was getting on rather nicely with the daffodil-haired young lady in the front office. He'd already discovered so far that her name was Desiri, and that her mother was a widow. Her father, it appeared, had been something in the Indian army, and that she had been destined for a career as a doctor. Then Papa had died once of... once of cholera... And once, of neg- and once of a negative spear thrust. There appeared to be two versions, and Desire had been forced to take up shorthand typing to keep a home together. The only other information about her that Mr Pavarius had been able to acquire was that she was 32 round the bust. The point arose naturally out of a conversation about jumpers that her hair was really that colour and that she liked open to, open-toed shoes and sunbathing. It was no use allowing his thoughts to wander in that direction because Mr Jerome, his cigar gripped firmly between his teeth, was already waiting for him. With no more, therefore, than a hasty ta-ta coming from the top of his welcoming cooey, Mr Bavarius left Desiree, Desiree and went in. Got some good news for you, Cavendish, Mr Jerome said with a quick roll of the cigar from right to left. You mean about... you you mean about handbag hanky? Mr Pavarius asked eagerly. Handbag hanky? Mr Jerome said contemptuously. Forget it. Give it a rest. Bury it. It isn't worth crying over. This is something important. It's lullaby lady I'm talking about. I have a place. It's in a panto. There is no pantomime in May, Mr Pavarius subjected. There will be when December comes, 
Mr Jerome told him, Puss in Boots. End of the first act, principal boy number, words on the screen, audience singing the chorus, all the children joining in, everything lovely. Well, well, said Mr Pavarius. Let's see if we can uh, agree about the uh, royalty scale. But in this... He'd gone too far. Mr Jerome fixed his teeth more firmly with the cigar and leant forward across the little desk. We haven't touched on the financial side, he said severely. It's only placed. The uh, lyric needs tidying up, something more topical, you know. Uh, and they don't like the chorus. They've got their own man on it now, subject to your approval, of course. And they want it reorchestrated. Sid's looking after that. And Ollie's rearranging it. Sid and Ollie, Mr Bavarius inquired vaguely. They're under contract, Mr Jerome explained. You can't cut them out, so it's no use trying. Uh, no, I, I was only wondering, Mr Bavarius began. Then don't, Mr Jerome told him. If you break with them, you're through. As it is, they'll expect something. Oh, how much? Mr Bavarius asked. Twenty-five each and fifty for you. Mr Bavarius paused. It was at the moment such as this when he wished he was a better businessman, a stronger character altogether, someone with teeth. They're on to easy money, very e easy money. Who? I don't know. Oh, yeah. They're on, they're on easy money, very easy money, he said slowly. Who represents them? Mr Jerome shifted the cigar into a position again somewhere underneath his left ear. I do, he said. Of a slip. But even with 50% of his new earnings about to go to Sid and Ollie, Mr Bavarius felt that strange excitement, a kind of electric stimulation running right through nerves and sinews that's known by all artists on the verge of achievement. And Mr Jerome had shown himself the large-headed gentleman that he really was with scarcely any cajoling from Mr Bavarius, who kept mentioning that he was thinking of moving over to Chapels or Francis, Day and Hunter. Mr Ger Chapels, by the way, I do know, was a music... Um, uh, a music... Chapels. They, they also do um, library music, funnily enough. Uh, they've been going for years. I don't know about Francis, Day and Hunter, but maybe they're another one who really do exist. Anyway... Um, so, yeah, so he kept mentioning that he was thinking of moving over to Chapels or Francis Day and Hunter. Mr Pavarius had agreed to advance him, Mr Jerome rather, had agreed to advance him £25 against future royalties. And this put an entirely new complexion on the whole affair. Mr Pavarius found himself cordially liking Sid and Ollie. But in the midst of his exhalation, ex hilar ex ex hilari Exhil oh, hang on, why can't I say that word? Exhilaration. That's not how it's pronounced, but I know how it's pronounced, but I can't say it for some reason. The brain's gone frozen. Ex, ex, exhilaration. Anyway, whatever. A wave of something colder, of sheer mortal loneliness swept over him. It was dreadful that someone so gifted, so successful, so conspicuous in funds should be left in London without a friend. Eight million people, and not one of them who cared whether he went under the first bus. His self-sorrow was still mounting as he passed through the outer office, but a glimpse of the daffodil-coloured curls over the top of the filing cabinet made him pause. He walked over to the little frosted window marked Inquiries and tapped playfully on the, on the glass. Cooey, he began. After what seemed... An unnecessarily long pause. The window shot up and the young lady looked out. You again? she asked. She was using a chamois leather buffer on her nails. I again? Mr Pavarius told her. Well, I've, um, <clears throat> I've just been given two theatre tickets tonight, Mr Pavarius began. Uh, but the Colonel's daughter... But the Colonel's daughter stopped him. Not in there you haven't, she told him. He never gives anyone anything. Well, would you like... Well, what would you like to see? he asked. The young lady was at work with her little finger by now. That's more like it, she said. 
Well, Mr. Pavarius asked. Well, what? Well, what's it going to be? Please yourself entirely, she said. It's no affair of mine. She'd picked up a nail file and was at work, like a real craftsman. I never go out with accommodation addresses, thank you. Accommodation addresses? Mr. Pavarian, Pavarius paused. Oh, oh, but I only use the box number for business purposes, he told her. The young lady removed a fragment of loose nail from her teeth. Well, I didn't imagine you lived in it, she said. And it doesn't matter where, and, and does it matter... And does it matter to you where I live? Mr. Pavarius asked, hopefully. Couldn't matter less, the young lady replied. All the same, it's usual for the gentleman to say. She was hard at work with the polisher again by now, and Mr. Pavarius could only see the thick cluster of daff the curls, daffodil in colour, current chrysanthemum in construction, a mere six inches from him, and with the wire mesh of the inquiry desk between them. And it's useful, and it's useful, she added after a pause, that is, if you ever want to see them again. She looked up as she said it, and Mr. Pavarius found himself gazing deeply into the pure cornflower blue of her eyes. The eyelashes, his note, he noticed, were long, black and romantically clotted with mascara. Over dinner, Mr. Pavarius learnt a lot more about Desiri. Manners was the surname. Her life story was entirely remarkable. First, there was the old place in Sussex with all the horses. Then there was the unfortunate father of hers, whose third death apparently occurred when the liner that was bringing him back from Ceylon floundered on the rocks off Cape Town. Her mother had gone down at the same time with Desira's baby brother clasped in her arm. From this, Mr. Pavarius gathered that it must have been another son of the ill or ill-omened marriage whom Desiri was now helping through Sandhurst. And Desiri herself seemed to have been educated almost everywhere, in a convent in Switzerland, privately by a governess in the manor is, in the Manorises rambling old mansion in Sussex, in India and alternatively in Ceylon, and at finishing school in Cheltenham. She had sung. She had danced. She had once spoken French like a native, though even though that she had now for forgotten it all. But the very moment her brother Terence had passed out of Sandhurst and had been appointed to his ship, she was going to chuck everything up and go off to Paris, where she guessed that is where she really belonged. There was also... An only partial explanation. Sorry, there was only uh, there was also an only partially explained kid sister who, like all the Mannerises, Mannerises, had contrived somehow to pack a lot into a short time. At this very moment, she was studying law, dancing in ballet at Monte Carlo, on tour with an opera company at Oldham, and engaged to a guards officer with pots of money and another of those old places that keep turning up all over Sussex. As the meal proceeded, indeed the champagne served to break down all her accustomed retinence, reticence, she was in trouble with her dressmaker. And until her third dead father had sent her her, her next month's allowance, she frankly didn't know where the next week's rent was coming from. Mr. Pavarius put his hand into his pocket while she was speaking and fingered tenderly the crisp one-pound notes that Mr. Jerome had given him. He felt that even if he didn't know, he did. Sorry, he felt that even if she didn't know, he... Oh, yes, he felt that even if she didn't know, he did. The meal had been a good one. Lobster, duck... Crepe Suzettes, and the moment had come for the coffee and liqueurs. He was disappointed that Desire had chosen creme de menthe and felt that Cointreau might have been more ladylike, but the creme de menthe could not have been more effective if it had been prescribed by himself. It did everything that could have been expected of it. By the time she had lapped up the last emerald drop with her tongue, she sat back and said, what do we do now? 
Mr Bavarius cunningly suggested the theatre. But it was too late for the theatre, he knew that. Shaftesbury Avenue was already into its third act, and until Mr Pavarius got new glasses, he didn't want to go to a cinema because films made his eyes ache. Dancing, too, was out of the question because he was wearing crepe rubber rubber soles. I only wish I could su suggest continuing our little conversation at home, Mr Pavarius said plainly, but alas, we would be interrupted. I, I share bachelor chambers with a friend, you see. Oh, that's all right, Desiri told him. Please don't apologise on my account. I hate to disturb your friend. friend. Besides, I wouldn't dream of going back there. I scarcely know you. Then you must take me to your home, Mr Pavarius told her. On that I insist, I positively insist. Anywhere you say, and we can go talking in the taxi. Well, I don't imagine I'm going to ask you in, because I won't, Desiree said firmly, speaking exactly as her father, the Colonel, would have wished her to speak. I've got my own reputation to think of as much as you. Just so, Mr Pavaria, Pavarius answered her. I shall imagine nothing, and then I can't be disappointed, can I? When Desiree was safely inside the taxi, her two hands folded demurely in her lap, Mr Pavarius turned smilingly towards her. Uh, where to? he asked. Where does my lady want? Med Medina Road, Desiree said sleepily. 23B. Tell him to go to Putney Underground and I'll tell him from there. Putney? Mr Pavarius repeated in a flat, hollow-sounding voice. Uh, did you say Madeira Road, Putney? That's right, Desiree answered. Yes, it's just off St Mark's Avenue at the bottom. You needn't sound so worried. It's only four and six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is, lives at the bottom of St Mark's Avenue, which is very close to the Bodwin's Archbishop's Hospital. Oh, my giddy aunt. Good afternoon to everybody who's just joined us. Richard, says Susan Luca. Uh, I am a bit late today. I just wanted to say I love your filming and your shows. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Susan, for coming in and, and saying that. It's very kind of you. Dudley Sawyer is there. Good afternoon, everyone. Here with Marmite sandwich and a cup of tea. Sounds delicious. Edward Moulding, pure oxygen, more like pure CO2. <laughs> and Josh, uh, Josh Hastings says, sounds like a gangster rapper, bandanas and a horseshoe shoe print. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what ho, Andrew Norris is here. Michael White, good afternoon to every book, to you bookish people. And Lee Lawson says, um, I've forgotten my mother's chamois leather nail buffer somewhere. I'd forgotten about those. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, you've got it. That's what she says. Dis oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm getting this wrong, aren't I? Desire is full of it. Des oh, is it Desiree? Oh, Desiree, Julius, is um, Desiree, not Desiree. Desiree. All right, Desiree. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You know I'm crap at names and places and words and things. I do my best. Anyway, Desiree, we have left her going to the bottom of... Uh, St. Mark's Avenue. Meanwhile, chapter XV11, what's that, 15, 16, 17, we are with Dr. Trump. Saw you on Alistair Williams' programme last night, Mike, says Michael White. What? On Alistair Williams' programme? What was that about? Dr. Trump had made up his mind. Mr. Dawlish would have to go. Admittedly, the decision itself was a recent one, but the steps leading up to it had been slow and inevitable. In the first place, it was Mr Dawlish's appearance that had counted so much against him. As a non-smoker himself, Dr Trump disliked all smokers, but a dirty smoker was more than, dis was more than dislikable. He was downright disgusting. And it had to be admitted that Mr Dawlish was dirty. Positively frousty, in fact. There was, an, there was ash all over him. There, then there was his shoes. Other masters somehow contrived to keep their shoes clean, but not Mr Dawlish. He could come sloping down the stairs in the morning with shoes that look as if they'd spent the night in the kitchen garden. It was a key point, the shoes. 
Dr Trump had noticed before that had noticed before that clean shoes and self-respect always went together. He knew now at the first hint of shoe trouble to look out for other danger signs. And in Mr Dawlish they were all there. Unpressed trousers, bulged pockets, ragged fingernails, creased ties, untidy collar, badly shaven chin. In short, the man was a specimen of advanced social disintegration, an outcast. But in any case, it was not Mr Dawlish alone who was occupying Mr Trump, Dr Trump's thoughts. Mr Dawlish himself was no more than a pawn, a solitary pathetic piece in a complicated and majestic game. For what Dr Trump was working on now was nothing less than a complete reorganisation. With, with commendable thoroughness, he had already got down to details. Hard facts, figures, personalities. There were 14 members of the teaching staff altogether, drawing salaries that averaged £3.10 a week, and all found. £182 a year apiece, 2,548 altogether, with food, heat, light and laundry on top, say roughly 3,000. No wonder the balance sheet was such a nightmare. But under the reorganisation, things would be different. For a start, he was going to reduce the teaching staff from 14 to 9. There remained merely the question of which ones should go. And here Dr Trump reminded himself that a good administrator had to be impersonal. Motives like sympathy and compassion that were admirable in other connections were entirely irrelevant here. And more than irrelevant, they were wicked. There was indeed only one criteria that, would, that could fairly be applied. Age. In short... It was the elderly, the infirm, and of course the difficulty must be who to go first. Three out of the five had been easy. First there was Mr Dawlish, then Mr Jeffcoat, who was 63 and had trouble with his eyes, and then Mr Pavarius. It, was cert it certainly wasn't age in his case. At most the man was no more than an abominably well-preserved 50. With him it was something that went even deeper than time. It was his moral attitude. Whatever Dr Trump had, whenever Dr Trump had been with Mr Pavarius for any period, he felt as though he'd been in the presence of someone not entirely, not scrupulously clean. On the women's side, it was a question of Mrs Gurnett that had troubled Dr Trump most. That she was obstinate, uncooperative, even openly hostile, had been apparent from the start. But who was there to replace her? So in the end, Dr Trump left Mrs Gurnett untouched and decided on Mrs Wynne and Mrs Glubb instead. And with good reason. They were both on the verge of 60. Neither was well. Each, again, had private sorrows that, they were, that were interfering with their work. With Miss Wayne, it was the death of her mother that had affected her. And with Miss Glubb, it was a... Goitier. What's a goitier? So far as Miss Glubb was concerned, indeed, this was doubly unfortunate. For her ailment... Oh, it's an ailment. Uh, for her ailment was both unsightly and incurable. Dr Trump therefore decided, in the interests of everyone, he had better act now and immediately. Unscrewing the top of his presentation fountain pen, he began to write... The warden presents its compliments to Mr Dawlish and would be obliged if Mr Dawlish would attend in the warden's study at... Dot, dot, dot. Would you say that this Dr Trump was on the lookout for caked shoes? Yes, he may well be. Caked shoes. A lump in the neck. Oh, is that what it is? A goiter. Is that how it's pronounced? A goiter. A lump in the neck. Oh. Dr Trump had cancelled all other engagements. The entire morning from 9am till lunchtime was set aside for the dismissals. 
and when the first knock came at the door, he was ready. Oh God, he had prayed f f fervently less than five minutes earlier after going over the last of the star files. Make me worthy of my task, make me strong. Let neither pity or weakness blind me or deter me. Let me be ruthless in my righteous cause. Even so, it did not prove easy. He had been forced to change his original order and it was Miss Ween Wynn whom he was seeing first. The accident of sex embar embarrassed him because it was uh, because it was a woman. It was going to be, sorry, I'm, I'll read this again. The accident, the accident of sex embarrassed him because it was a woman that was being sacrificed. He tried to make things easy for her to be ruthless in a kindly, almost paternal fashion. And the result, he, he rather overplayed his hand. He was too disarming. For the first few moments of the interview, in fact, Miss Wynne simply didn't know what he was driving at. And then, when she discovered, she burst into tears. You want me to leave? You mean you want me to leave? Not until the end of term, said Dr. Uh, Dr. Trump. Sorry, I forgot he was nasally, isn't he, Dr. Trump? Nasally. Not until the end of term, said Dr. Trump, Trump gently. Then there was a pause while Dr. Trump sat there looking at her. As he did so, he noticed with distaste that her skin was yellow rather than pink in colour and that it had a loose, puckered appearance that he had seen previously only on the breasts of slaughtered fowls. <laughs> there was no doubt about it. Miss Wynne was elderly all right. Deuced elderly. He even began to wonder if she'd been keeping her real age from him. There, abrupt, then, abruptly, the silence was broken. It all seems so unfair, she blurted out suddenly. First mother's death, and then this. But I, said Dr Trump, drawing back a little, can hardly be responsible for your poor mother's death. No, but you can for her far, for, no, but you can for her daughters, Mrs Wynne snapped back at him. And before Dr Trump could reply, a grave, crushing sort of reply that would have made further rejoinder impossible, Mrs Wynne had snatched up her handbag and, with her handkerchief pressed hysterically against her face, had flounced out of the room, leaving him there. But how differently Mr Jeffcoat responded. Even if Miss Wynne had not been a lady, at least Mr Jeffcoat was a gentleman. He sat with a bowed head listening silently while Dr Trump talked. And instead of resenting it when Dr Trump came to the real reason for his dismissal, failing eyesight, it seemed positively contrite. He seemed positively contrite about the affliction. He apologised, and, and more than apologised, he confessed his near blindness. He admitted quite openly that something that he'd been trying to conceal... Pressed by Dr Trump as to why he had not come forward like a man and said openly, I'm going blind, you must get rid of me, he explained that he simply could not afford to do so. Up to 18 months ago, it turned out that he'd been making a regular monthly allowance to an invalid sister seven years older than himself and in consequence had not been able to save a single penny. There was nothing for it, therefore, but to go on, even though from the back of the classroom he could not see so much as the blackboard. In short, it was sheer poverty that had made him be so dishonest. Dr Trump pondered. Then going over to Mr Jeffcott, he put his hand on the man's shoulder. But do not imagine, he said, that I or the governors of the hospital would wish anyone nearly thirty years' service to go out of the world unprovided for. There is, unfortunately, though, no pension scheme. That was an oversight on the part of my predecessor, but uh, perhaps there is uh, something I can do. Yes, said Mr Jeffcoat, eagerly screwing up his pale, failing eyes as he looked into the light. What is it, please? Our bishop, uh, Bishop Warpole, said Dr Trump, looking at his watch, is um, an intimate friend of mine. He is also an honorary president of the St Nicholas Almshouse in Wimbledon. 
Now, I cannot promise anything, of course, but I'll drop a hint, a broad hint, next time we are together. There was a pause. Thank you, replied Mr Jeffcott feebly. And in the meantime, take my advice, said Dr Trump, still speaking in the same mild but manly voice, and avoid all unnecessary reading. That will only make matters worse. At first, Dr Trump had resolved to finish his elevenses before seeing Mr Pervarius. But Ovaltine made him freshly boiled. Uh, Ovaltine made with freshly boiled milk conserves its heat amazingly, and he saw no reason why, for that Mr. Pervarius's sake, he shouldn't ris risk scolding himself. He liked his Ovaltine and wanted to be able to sip it slowly and worthily. Moreover, he asked himself, wasn't there something impressively unperturbed about such behaviour? Wouldn't it be, more than anything else, show Mr Pervarius the unsaleable contempt that he had for him if he went on sipping throughout the interview? Therefore, with his cup no more than tasted, he rang his fatal bell for the last time. On this occasion, he was unaccountably kept waiting. It was as though Mrs Prinny had not heard him. Wait a minute, I thought he was going to see Mr Bavarius. It was, in fact... Oh, uh, Mrs Prinny must be his uh, secretary, I suppose. He was, in fact, about to ring again when he heard Mr Bavarius's voice outside in the corridor. Thank you, thank you, Mrs Prinny, he was saying. My hands are full, you understand, otherwise... A moment later, the door opened and Mr Bavarius stood there, smiling. I hope I'm not too early. I hope. He began gazing upon Dr Trump with a smile that every moment was mounting to a, to a leer. Come in, Dr Trump replied coldly. I am waiting. And I've brought my own mid-morning snack along with me, Mr Bavarius answered, stepping forward out of the shadows in the doorway. I thought that you wouldn't mind if we shared our modest refreshment together. In his hand was a cup and saucer. From above the rim of the cup, a thin veil of mist was rising. Dr Trump didn't trust himself to catch Mr Pervarius's eye. Instead, he glared at the offending object. Mr Pervarius intercepted the glare. Milk, he explained. Plain, boiled milk. I rarely change. Cocoa sometimes, but in the end I go back to plain, pure milk. Sit down, said Dr Trump. Thank you, thank you, Mr Pervarius answered. You are more than kind. You know why I have sent for you, Dr Trump began. Mr Pervarius nodded. How difficult it is, he admitted, to guard even the best kept secrets. And to think that this should have leaked out too... Oh, sorry, that was Mr Pervarius speaking. I beg your pardon. Mr. So, yes, you, you know why I've sent for you, Mr Trump began. Mr Pervarius nodded. How difficult it is, he admitted, to guard even the best-kept secrets and to think that this one should have leaked out too. Secrets? Mr Dr Trump asked unwarily. Mr Pervarius' eyes opened in still wider astonishment. Why, yes, uh, the BBC... Do not tell me that I that, do do not tell me now that I have confessed it that you've not heard. Explain yourself. Our choir, the broadcast, uh, broadcast. Doctor Trump's nostrils dilated as he said the word. What broadcast? Oh, then you haven't heard. Mister Pervarius replied gleefully, but. You have a right to know. The BBC is anxious that our choir should sing to all of Great Britain. In a series, you understand. Voices of Children. The national programme, I believe. And, and, when is this to be? Dr Trump inquired. Despite himself, he could not help being interested. Mr Pervarius paused. Oh, uh, next term, he said slowly. Somewhere in the second half, uh, Sir John Reith is still considering. The date is not yet fixed, merely pencilled in. June the 3rd, I fancy. 
Dr Trump did some rapid thinking. The date was certainly very awkwardly placed. It would mean enduring Mr Pervarius's company longer than seemed possible. But think of it, the Archbishop Bodkin Cloristers on the BBC. It was terrific. Looked at in round figures, it was probably worth a thousand pounds in unsolicited donations. Mr Pervarius, however, interrupted him. Uh, but I, uh, I see you are dubious. Dr Trump heard the words as though they were coming through a thick curtain. Uh, that you are thinking of the effect of the children? Perhaps you're, you're, you're right. Uh, the experience may be harmful. Dr Trump started. Harmful, he said. On, on the contrary, if they are brought straight home again by bus, they can come to no possible harm. No, I, I meant to their voices, Mr Pervarius explained. If I thought that a single treble, even an isolated alto, had been overtaxed by the strain of a public performance. Nonsense, said Dr Trump. Think of choir boys in cathedrals. They're at it all the time, weekdays as well. Of course our children will sing. As you say, of course, Mr Pervarius agreed politely. Exactly as you say, but I really cannot hold myself responsible. Then I shall accept full responsibility, Dr Trump told him. Then uh, you don't feel the publicity would be distasteful? Dr Trump didn't reply immediately. Publicity had suddenly become one of life's truly beautiful words. It had taken its place alongside discipline and reorganisation. Publicity? Distasteful? He began. That afternoon... Mr Pervarius sat down to write a letter. It was addressed to the Je Director General, BBC, and there were half a dozen sheets of pale mauve notepaper in the waste bin basket before it was finished, and to Mr Pervarius's entire satisfaction. It read, My dear sir, I am in the sole charge of the music in recognition... I am in sole charge of the music in a recognised educational establishment and wishes to offer the services of my choir in connection with the new series, which I suggest might be entitled Voices of Children, suitable for the national programme. The use of the choir would, of course, be entirely free, as for myself, I am ready to relay, without demur upon your generosity, Captain, certain of the settings of my own and these two, I... Certain of the settings are my own, and these two, I assume, would be paid for at the usual rates. If you would like to have me call upon you in order to discuss the matter more fully... Dot, 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 dot. So, in other words, he bluffed his way out of that because he knew the chop was coming and he made it all up. <laughs> oh, you've got to laugh at Dr. Perver Mr. Pervarius. He's a card, isn't he? Dr. Trump is just like, just, oh, can't quite cope. He can't quite cope. Dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Norman Collins does not write flattering of we flatteringly of women, does he, says Le Lee Lawson. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I think it, it, he may not. It's true. But, uh, you, you know, <laughs> I think that, um, that Mrs. Wynne was an Irene Handel character wasn't she she was an Irene Handel a sort of coy version of Irene Handel oh you've got to laugh how are we doing can we get through to the next we can get through. oh yes we can get to the end of book three I think we can uh, book two and uh, that will be us for today so here we go chapter 18 excuse me You can make all the rules you like, take every precaution, erect barricades and put broken bottles along the tops of walls, but you still can't prevent two people seeing each other, other if they have really set their hearts on it, even if one of them has. It, sorry, even if only one of them has. Take Sweetie and Ginger, for instance. Sweetie was getting on for nine by now, and the first promising moment had come when Sweetie discovered that by climbing up onto the top of the water butt outside the junior's girl's lavatory, she could see into the boy's playground over the crescent of the gate 
that curved downward in the middle. It wasn't much of a view, just a narrow half-moon of playground, and it was difficult at first to distinguish Ginger from the other 250 bodkin orphans who exercised themselves on that particular stretch of asphalt. But size, of course, was a help. And behaviour. And were generally two or three boys following Ginger. But it was his hair that was the certain, the infallible feature of recognition. First, the colour, a fine flower pot red, and then the peculiar ridge like structure that made it stand up in front like a saint's halo that had slipped forward. As soon as Sweetie saw that she as soon as Sweetie saw that, she knew that she'd found the right one. Then the problem was simply how to attract his attention. Calling cooey was no good because everyone was calling out cooey. She couldn't whistle because her front teeth weren't firm enough. And it would simply have been asking for trouble to shout out his name for everyone to else to hear. So in the end, she resorted to an accomplishment of which Anyhow, she was to an accomplishment of which, anyhow, she was extremely proud. She had learnt it from Annie, the slow-witted Bodkinian, who was still about the place, and it consisted of inserting the forefinger between the front, front lips and emitting a high-pitched ululation, a Red Indian love call, Annie had told her, and Sweetie had been practising it for some time. Now that she was proficient, the love call could cut through the uproar of the break period like a skewer. Not that it got it not that it got her very far to begin with. The first time Ginger realised that he was the object of this singular alarm note, he was openly resentful. He came out he came over to the gate and told her to shut up. But when she was there the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that as well, he saw that it was hopeless. Threats weren't, to get, weren't going to get rid of her and he must try something else instead. But he was still cautious. What you want? he asked. I can see you, Tweety told him. Well, of course you can see me, Ginger answered. But what you want? Only just to see you, Sweetie replied. The extreme silliness of her response persuaded him that it would be pointless to continue the conversation. At this rate, they would never get anywhere. You're balmy, he said shortly. You're soppy. Considering the snub, Sweetie was quite philosophic. She had seen him again, and she had got him to take notice of her, which was all that really mattered. And the device had worked splendidly. Because the next day, when Sweetie climbed up, Ginger was there, waiting for her. Admittedly, he moved away as soon as she came into sight, but it showed that he was thinking about her, for he came back twice more, each time covering up his face with his hands so as to be unrecognisable, just to see if she was still looking. She often wondered how many times he would turn up after that, because she wasn't there herself. This wasn't due to any slackening off on her part, but simply on the fact that the cover of the water butt caved in as she was getting onto it. She was a tall, it was a tall butt with a better part of five feet of water in it, and it was very near the end of Sweetie. By the time Nurse Stedge had heard her thrashing about inside, she'd gone under for the third time. And though she was able to support the drowning girl with one arm, it required Sergeant Chittick's strength to withdraw Sweetie. After that, Sweetie spent three days in the infirmary and Dr Trump had danger notices and barbed wire fixed to all the water butts. It was largely because she kept it was largely because she was kept in the infirmary that she had so much time on her hands. So she decided that she would write to Ginger. She would use ordinary she wouldn't she would use an ordinary piece of exercise paper fold it up into a paper dart and simply shoot it over the top of the dividing wall. Then Ginger could read it and send his reply by the same route. A whole barrage of correspondence could pass between them in this way. But again, there were difficulties. In the first place, somebody else might happen... Somebody else might see it all happening and stop it immediately. Then there would be more trouble and no sweets. 
Secondly, she couldn't be sure that Ginger would reply. He might simply catch the note and then keep them. But it was the third difficulty which was the greatest of all. She couldn't make paper darts, never had been able to, and didn't know where to begin. But even if she could think of, but even if she could think of no means of actually sending the letter, it was still fun writing to him. And sitting up in bed in the infirmary, she wrote, For Ginger, for Ginger, for Ginger, over and over again, all down the piece of paper that Nurse Stedge had given her to keep her quiet. And that is as far as, as it would ever have got if it had not been for Annie, who had, told, who had taught her the love call. A simple-minded, if not actually deficient creature, she had the bright scarlet thread of true romance running right through her nature. Sweetie did not have to even explain what she was up to. Annie spotted it at once. Is Ginger your boyfriend? she asked. Sweetie considered the question. Mm, not really, she said. I don't think he likes me. But you like him? Sweetie was silent again. Yes, she said at last. Very much. Well, you write your letter and I'll get it to him, Annie promised. Only, don't tell anybody. Cross your heart. Sweetie crossed her heart. I'll write it now, she said, licking the pencil in readiness. She took some time over it, making several full starts before she was satisfied. Then, when it was finished, she doubled the paper over so that no one else should see. She had done her work carefully, and to avoid any possible mistake, she had used block capitals throughout. It was a perfect little letter, and said everything that she could have wanted it to say. She sat back exhausted and waited for Annie to come round again. Naturally, Annie wanted to read what was written, and Sweetie didn't in the mind least showing her. She was rather proud, in fact. What she was absolutely unprepared for, however, was to find that Annie didn't think much of it. Is that all you're going to say? Annie asked. Sweetie read the letter again from start to finish. Hmm, that's all, she said. Aren't you even going to sign it? Sweetie looked up. She was worried now. Perhaps there was something wrong with the letter after all. Do you think I ought to? she asked anxiously. Well, he won't know who it's from if you don't, Annie told her. But Sweetie only smiled. He'll know all right, she said. And with that, she handed the letter back again. All that it said was, For Ginger. In affairs between the sexes, Annie was at the highest fulfilment of her nature. She was deriving a vicarious and sub sublimated form of pleasure from the whole episode, even if it didn't amount to much, couldn't in the nature of things ever hope to add up to anything, it was still, a, it was still serving the cause. And it was starting off all right. She recognised that Sweetie had got the right stuff in her. She had even thrust the message, for what it was worth, right into Ginger's own hands, and she'd been forced to invent an entirely unnecessary journey to the boy's side to do so. This had, been t this had taken some arranging. Not half so much as bending down and pretending to pick up the piece of paper so that, if anyone was watching, it would look as though Ginger had dropped it. She even managed to say under her breath, I didn't write it, it's from Sweetie. And this was very thoughtful of her, because when he read it, Ginger realised that if she hadn't explained, he wouldn't have had the least idea who it was from. Anyhow, Ginger, anyhow, Ginger found it an awful bore getting it. You see, it worried him, and he resented it. Why couldn't she leave him alone? Why did she have to climb up on things and holler at him? And now, why did she have to send him a piece of paper with For Ginger written on it? At odd moments during the next three days, he pondered on her inexplicable behaviour. Perhaps she was a bit mad, he decided. And then a little incident occurred that made him see things in a new light. I had to turn the fire off and get a bit warm here. It's all getting warm under the collar. And then a little incident occurred that made him see things in a new light. One of the seniors, a big fellow of practically 14, 
was found over in the laundry section talking through the window to one of the junior laundresses. The ironing section was absolutely forbidden territory to the boys of any age and because of his this flouting of authority, Dr Trump caned him immediately, caned him despite the fact that the boy was almost as tall as he was. This made Ginger think. If he'd been discovered in the girl's side and at night too, his punishment might have been anything. Prison, most probably, or at any rate, a ref, a ref, a re reformatory, a reformatory, a reformatory. That must have been like a borstal, I suppose, a reformatory. And Sweepy and Sweetie had saved him from what, without even so much as a thought for her own reputation. Clearly, he had a cause to be grateful. So, simply because Dr Trump had caned one of the seniors, Ginger wrote his reply. He did it during geography, right under Mr Dawlish's nose. In the circumstances, it wasn't as carefully written as Sweetie's, and by the time he'd got it under into Annie's hands, it was pretty dirty looking because there had been other things in the same pocket. But Sweetie didn't mind about that. It said all she could have wanted it to say. In Ginger's bold and manly handwriting, it read, For Sweaty. For Sweaty. <laughs> S-W-E-A-T-Y. Bless him. That is uh, the end of book two. We're on book three now, The Night of Fire, but we will be on that tomorrow in uh, The Children of the Archbishop by Norman Collins. I hope you've enjoyed that. Dear, oh dear. Lamb to slaughter a trump card. Hope you enjoyed that, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all well and doing good things. Thank you very much for coming along and listening if you did. Um, I will... Uh, there's no Vogue show tonight. Um, I've got to go and do a recording shortly. Um, and I've got to go and get the SE lit because it's cold in the house, although it's actually quite warm in here because this little heater has heated up this room nicely, but I've just turned, turned the blooming thing off. Anyway, there we go. Thank you very much for coming. I will catch up with you uh, next time, tomorrow, no doubt. Uh, in the meantime, we do have a video for tomorrow. i just got to go and upload it, which I must go and sort out now. Glad you enjoyed that. Uh, Edward Moulding says, we did enjoy. Sorry about the fluffs, as ever. Doing my best not to fluff, but hey-ho, it gets you sometimes. Um, some days are better than others. But there you are. Anyway, must go. Things to do, people to see, phone calls to write, letters to eat. Uh, once again, we the dear listener, thank you kindly, Richard, says Turbo Stream. Thank you very much. Tally-ho, keep warm, keep warm. See you tomorrow. All the best. Bye for now. Bye.